Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is mechanical power, torque, and rotational speed. Our objective is to describe mechanical power produced by rotating actuators like motors in terms of the measurable quantities, torque, and rotational speed. This lecture operates under the presumption that viewers watch the Motor Family Tree Lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet, or only didn't recall its contents, please take the time to do so now. Additionally, this lecture presumes the viewer has a basic familiarity with AC power and three-phase AC. If you're a little rusty on these subjects, not to worry. Guidance will be provided for performing three-phase AC power calculations during the course of this lecture. First and foremost of our tasks is to introduce and define an extremely misunderstood, or at least by most individuals with a primary electrical background, means of measuring rotational mechanical force, namely torque. Torque is a twisting force. Force applied linearly for people of reasonable intelligence is very easy to visualize. Twisting, not so much. For linear applications, it's easy to imagine pushing, pulling, or moving an object that weighs or otherwise resists you a certain amount, be it in units of pounds, force, or newtons, over a certain distance, be it in unit of feet or meters. At the time you stop moving the object, you sit back, crack a cold one, and say, I've done work today. By using the term work, it means you've put a certain amount of energy into a system. That energy is measurable as force times distance, expressed in units of foot pounds force or newton meters where a newton meter can easily be converted to joules, where one joule is one newton of force expressed for a distance of one meter. If I move an object that resists me with 800 newtons of force, a distance of three meters, this means I put 800 newtons times three meters or 2,400 newton meters into the system. If a joule is equivalent to a newton meter, this is equivalent to 2,400 joules. Additionally, using engineering prefixes, I can write this as 2.4 kilojoules. This should be pretty easy. Scenarios involving linear applications of force are featured prominently in the hydraulics and electrical controlled hydraulic systems playlist that deals primarily with a linear hydraulic actuator called cylinder. Now along comes a rotating actuator in the form of an electric motor that's driving a shaft that's revolving at a high rate of speed, but it's not really going anywhere. There's some obvious force behind that spinning shaft because rotating actuators like drills, blenders, saws, and grinders readily transform durable objects into dust. But how is all this measurable, quantifiable, and somehow comparable to our previous description of linear mechanical energy. My recommendation is to keep thinking linearly. Imagine if you will a winch with a rotating shaft that has a radius R. The shaft has a magic rope hooked to it. The magic rope doesn't weigh anything, nor does it have any thickness or stretch or break or give you rope burns or do any of the other things normal ropes do except pull. That rope is attached to an object that weighs or otherwise resists movement, a quantity of force being units of pounds force or newtons. Now, spin the shaft one full revolution. Aha! Some of you are already seeing where I'm going with this. Before we take this concept home, let's return to the concept of twisting. You are no doubt aware of a simple machine known as a lever. Levers make it easy to apply force because of their length. A longer lever will produce more torque given the same input. Don't believe me? Take that big old $200 textbook you never open, put it in one hand, and hold it close to your chest. Not so hard. Now extend your arm fully horizontally and keep it there. A little different, huh? There's more torque because that identical force is being applied with a longer lever. This twisting force is called torque, and it's directly proportional to both the force applied and the distance from the center of the circular arc it's trying to describe. Granted, with this textbook example, you've got gravity in there, and eventually that circular path isn't so circular. But for now, think of just that brief arc where the force is torquing your arms in a circular path. If that same torque is applied continuously along a complete circular path, it would act tangentially at every point. What does tangentially mean? It means like a stone from a sling. If we release the stone at any point, it flies tangential to the circular path and smashes through your neighbor's window. Yes, there's a good story behind that one. Getting back to the point of torque being proportional to both force and the radius, we get the formula torque equals force times radius. Longer lever, more torque. Smaller lever, less torque. More force, more torque. Less force, less torque. Commonly used units of torque would be foot-pounds force, inch-pounds force, or newton-meters. Notice the similarity of units with that of energy. Torque is not energy. It's still torque, despite the commonality in units. For those with a vector physics background, you realize energy is a scalar quantity, a one that has magnitude but no direction, whereas torque is a vector quantity, 
something with both magnitude and direction. The magnitude of torque may be the same at any given point in the circular path. However, a sling stone cast at points 180 degrees opposite of each other would cast the stone in two opposite directions, which is kind of the punchline to my sling stone through the neighbor's window story. Returning to our linear winch example, when a motor pulls the object toward it with a constant velocity and the load is neither accelerating nor decelerating, the winch will be producing torque equal to force times radius. Now consider the work or energy put into the system when the shaft turns one full revolution. From the perspective of the object, energy input to the system is force times distance because the object representing a resistance force moved a certain distance. It should be very easy to figure out that the distance traveled by the object is equal to the amount of magic rope that got wound around the perimeter of the shaft when the shaft revolves one turn. The perimeter of the shaft is 2 pi times the radius. If the distance equals 2 pi times the radius and energy is equal to force times distance, then we can substitute this definition of distance into our energy equation, where energy now equals to force times 2 pi radius. Knowing our earlier definition of torque is equal to force times radius, we can rearrange this equation to make it easier to spot a place where we can substitute torque. Ultimately, we can say energy for one full revolution of the shaft is equal to 2 pi times torque. This means every revolution of a shaft producing a given amount of torque delivers 2 pi torque of energy in units of joules. Ta-da! That's how torque is used to describe energy input to a system. Let's try an illustrated example of this concept. Consider a 2,000 newton force being exerted on a rope that is wound around a shaft with a radius of 25 millimeters. How much torque does the shaft exert? Torque is force times radius. 2,000 newtons times 25 millimeters or 0 0.025 meters yields 50 newton meters of torque. How much energy is imparted to this system for every single revolution? Energy is equal to 2 pi times torque. Every turn of the shaft should impart 2 pi times torque of energy into this system. 2 pi times 50 newton meters is 314.2 joules. Let's say the shaft is revolved 1,700 times. How much energy is imparted to this system with 1,700 turns of the shaft? 314.2 joules per turn times 1,700 turns is roughly 534.1 kilojoules. You think these shortcuts are too easy? one can always use alternate methods to confirm these results. With a shaft radius of 25 millimeters, a single turn of the shaft revolves 2 pi times 25 millimeters, or roughly 157.1 millimeters of rope onto the shaft, tugging that 2,000 newton object 157.1 millimeters closer. If the shaft turned 1,700 times, it means it's pulled that object 1,700 times 157.1 millimeters or roughly 267 meters closer. 2,000 newtons has been expressed a distance of 267 meters. Energy is force times distance. 2,000 newtons times 267 meters is equal to 534.1 kilojoules. Most likely these results are correct. And the magic show ain't over yet. Left out of this discussion entirely is time. Suppose this shaft performs these certain number of revolutions within a given time period. This means the same amount of energy can be input to our system slowly or rapidly and this time rate of energy change can be quantified. I am of course leading up to a discussion of power. Power is not energy. Energy is not power. Power is equal to energy over time. Power is a time rate expenditure or production of energy. If you are still hazy about the distinction between power and energy, by all means, check out the Energy and Power Lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel and clarify any remaining misconceptions. Here's an analogy. If you need to perform a certain task, it requires a certain amount of labor. Let's say you've got a stack of cord of firewood. A cord of firewood represents a measurable quantity of energy you put into a system. How fast you stack that cord of wood is your choice. If you knuckle down, shut up, and just stack the firewood in 30 minutes, you accomplish the task powerfully. If, however, you pick at the task, drag your feet, and bitch and moan about it over the course of eight hours, you did it not so powerfully. More powerful input allows you to accomplish the same task quicker, whereas less powerful input required more time to accomplish the same task. It makes sense. 
power is measured in units of energy per time, where one watt is equal to one joule per second. If you want to, you can package power up in some more readable arcane units called horsepower, where one horsepower is equal to 746 watts or 550 foot-pounds force per second. Linearly, power is easy to conceptualize. Rotationally, not so much, albeit it's intrinsically much easier to understand than our earlier discussion of torque because a rotational shaft is obviously rotating at a given speed or number of turns per given time period. If a shaft rotates slowly, yet it still exerts a constant amount of torque per revolution, chances are it's delivering less power to a system than one exerting the same amount of torque per revolution, but doing so at a greater rotational speed. The missing link in our discussion of power is this speed quantity, which some genius decided to represent mathematically with the letter N. Rotational speed is commonly expressed in units of revolution per minute, or its abbreviation RPM. Given a shaft with a radius R exerts a certain amount of torque for the course of one complete revolution, delivers 2 pi torque of energy per revolution, how quickly is it doing so? A how powerful is it? We have the energy, we have a rotational speed. If power is equal to energy per time, the answer is quite obviously energy per revolution multiplied by revolutions per time. Units of revolutions cancel out and you get energy per unit time. If however you stick with speed measuring units of revolution per minute though, you'll have a major problem because power must be expressed in watts or joules per second. Therefore, we must convert RPM to revolutions per second by converting one minute to 60 seconds. Our final expression of mechanical power is energy per revolution or two pi torque times revolution per time converted to seconds, where mechanical power is equal to two pi torque times rotational speed divided by 60. Since two pi and 60 are constants, pi being the irrational number 3.1415 blah blah blah, you'll sometimes see this formula written as power equals torque times rotational speed divided by 9.55. It's actually 9.54929 blah blah blah. There are all sorts of derivations for mechanical power given foot pounds of torque as an input and converting to joules, or given inch pounds of torque and converting to joules, or given newton meters of torque and converting to foot pounds force per second, but they're all useless to you because you're not going to remember them and I'm not going to make you remember them. The reason I'm not making you remember the different formulas is because I'm utterly confident in your ability to convert individual units at whatever level of abstraction necessary to get the job done. In summary, mechanical power in units of watts is equal to torque in units of newton meters times rotational speed in units of RPM divided by 9.55. Write this down in your notebook. Let's try some basic examples of this formula and its algebraic permutations. Consider an induction motor exerting 1.1 newton meters of torque at 1,736 RPM. Substituting our given torque and rotational speed value into the mechanical power formula demonstrates this motor is exerting roughly 200 watts, slightly more than a quarter horsepower. If this is the rated condition, i.e. the condition for which this motor was designed to operate, we'd most likely see this data specified in the motor nameplate. The rated condition for an induction motor is a single point on a speed torque curve. Other operational points exist. Design B induction motors exhibit a characteristic speed torque curve that looks something like this, where torque is plotted on the vertical y-axis and rotational speed on the horizontal x-axis. Consider the same motor at the no load condition, an occasion in which the motor turns rapidly, let's say at 1780 RPM, but exerts zero torque. Substituting our given torque and rotational speed values into the mechanical power formula demonstrates this motor is exerting zero watts of mechanical power. It makes sense. It's turning quickly, but not doing anything. Consider the same motor at maximum power conditions, an occasion in which torque and speed form a maximum power product. Let's say at the motor maximum power point, the motor turns 1364 RPM and exerts 2.1 newton meters of torque. Substituting our given torque and rotational speed values into the mechanical power formula demonstrates the motor is exerting roughly 300 watts. This is one and a half times the in excess of the motor's rated condition of 200 watts. However, as long as it's not sustained for any length of time, this 200 watt rated motor is capable of exerting a brief burst of 300 watts of power. Consider the same motor breakdown or maximum torque. An occasion in which the motor exerts maximum torque, however, rotational speed is slightly reduced. Let's say the motor is capable of exerting a max of 2.2 newton meters of torque at 1,194 RPM. 
Substituting our given torque and rotational speed values into the mechanical power formula demonstrates this motor is exerting roughly 275.1 watts. We're clearly on the downslope of power now. Lastly, consider the same motor at the locked rotor condition, an occasion in which the motor exerts a respectable amount of torque, but it isn't moving. Let's say the motor is capable of exerting 1.4 newton meters of torque at standstill. Substituting our given torque and rotational speed values into the mechanical power formula demonstrates this motor is exerting zero watts. It makes sense. It's not moving. If we were to plot mechanical power, the product of torque and rotational speed divided by a constant for this entire rotational speed range, we'd get a plot that looks something like a rightward leaning peak. At opposite extremes, I get the locked rotor and the no load condition, the motor exerts no power. And in between these extremes, the motor experiences peak power with a rated power condition on the face of the slope on the right. This is an important operational point because customarily motors are operated at or near the rated condition. At the rated condition, the motor turns at the rated speed, exerts the rated torque, and produces the rated power. This is the data you would most likely see on a motor nameplate because it's normally the most efficient means of operating that particular motor, or nearly so. Anything to the right of the rated condition is an underloaded condition, and theoretically, the motor could operate indefinitely at or under the rated condition. In contrast, anything to the left of the rated condition is an overload condition and isn't meant to be sustained for any length of time. Moving on, let's compare and contrast three different styles of 200 watt motors. One having a rated speed of 3472 RPM, one having a rated speed of 1736 RPM, and another having a rated speed of 1157 RPM. How can all of these be 200 watt motors with such radically different specifications? The answer is torque. Mechanical power is a product of torque and rotational speed, and given the observed differentials in rated speed, one might expect different rated torques given identical power ratings. An algebraic manipulation of the mechanical power formula solving for torque demonstrates torque equals mechanical power times 9.55 divided by rotational speed. Substituting in our given mechanical power and rotational speed values for the first motor demonstrates the first motor exerts roughly 0.6 newton meters of torque. Similarly, substituting our given mechanical power and rotational speed values for the second motor demonstrates the second motor exerts roughly 1.1 newton meters of torque. Finally, substituting our given mechanical power and rotational speed values for the third motor demonstrates the third motor exerts roughly 1.7 newton meters of torque. As these primitive graphics are meant to represent, the higher torque, slower speed motor also is physically larger than the lower torque, higher speed relatives, despite all of these being 200 watt motors. This example is meant to illustrate that different motors are designed for different tasks and they're not necessarily interchangeable. Do you need light torque at high speeds? Use the first motor. Do you need high torque at low speeds? Use the third motor. Do you need a motor to regularly exert more than 200 watts? Don't use any of these motors. Use a motor that can handle the power requirement without risk of damage. Let's put your understanding of the mechanical power formula to the test with a series of illustrated example problems. Given the specified data, see if you can solve the desired unknowns. Some problems may necessitate unit conversion and or algebraic manipulation. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following values. Our first example features a motor exerting two newton meters of torque while rotating at 1760 RPM. We're being asked to determine the mechanical power in units of watts, and again, horsepower. Substituting given torque and rotational speed values into the mechanical power formula demonstrates this motor is exerting roughly 368.6 watts. A unit conversion demonstrates 368.6 watts is just shy of half a horsepower. Our second example problem features a motor exerting two horsepower of mechanical power while rotating at 1160 RPM. We're being asked to determine the torque in units of newton meters. A unit conversion demonstrates two horsepower is equivalent to 1,492 watts. An algebraic manipulation of the mechanical power formula solving for unknown torque demonstrates torque equals mechanical power times 9.55 divided by rotational speed. Substituting our given mechanical power and rotational speed values into this algebraic manipulation demonstrates this motor is exerting roughly 12.3 newton meters of torque. Finally, consider a three-quarter horsepower motor with a rated 1.6 newton meters of torque. We're being asked to determine the rotational speed. A unit conversion demonstrates three-quarter horsepower is roughly equivalent to 559.5 watts. 
An algebraic manipulation of the mechanical power formula solving for unknown rotational speed demonstrates rotational speed is equal to mechanical power times 9.55 divided by torque. Substituting our given mechanical power and torque into the algebraic manipulation demonstrates this motor is spinning at roughly at 3,339.5 RPM. By the way, RPM is typically expressed without the use of engineering units. There is no such thing as 3.3 kilo RPM. Easy, right? Let's step it up a bit with two additional illustrated examples necessitating an understanding of efficiency, unit conversion, and power calculations. Follow along, or if you're up to the challenge, try them yourself. The properties of torque and rotational speed aren't limited to electrical motors, but can also be used to quantify the output of rotating mechanical linkages and other rotational actuators, like hydraulic motors. Consider a simplified block diagram of a modern horizontal axis wind turbine consisting of the hub and main shaft assembly, the gearbox high-speed and coupling assembly, and the generator and power conversion assembly. This example will largely concern itself with a gearbox. Let's say at 12 meters per second, the hub is exposed to 5 megawatts of wind power, of which only 2 megawatts is transferred to the gearbox. Let's say the hub spins the main shaft at a relatively relaxed rate of 25 RPM. The gearbox is known to have a 1 to 50.4 step up ratio with respect to speed and has an efficiency of 95%. We're being asked to determine the torque of the main shaft as well as the torque, power, and rotational speed of the gearbox output shaft. First, let's determine the torque exerted by the main shaft. An algebraic manipulation of the mechanical power formula solving for unknown torque demonstrates torque equals mechanical power times 9.55 divided by rotational speed. We know the main shaft experiences 2 megawatts of input power and rotates at 25 RPM. Substituting these values into algebraic manipulation demonstrates the main shaft exerts an astonishing 764 kilonewton meters of torque. Given the gearbox is known to have a 1 to 50.4 step up ratio with respect to speed, the output shaft should be rotating at 50.4 times 25 or 1260 RPM. Efficiency is equal to output over input. An algebraic manipulation of the efficiency formula solving for output demonstrates that output is equal to input times efficiency. Substituting in our given values demonstrates the gearbox successfully transfers 1.9 megawatts of usable mechanical power to the generator. Given known speed and known mechanical power, we can substitute these given values into an algebraic manipulation of the mechanical power formula solving for torque, which demonstrates the high-speed shaft exerts roughly 14.4 kilonewton meters of torque. While we've got this example in front of us, let's talk about what's going on here. You'll note the gearbox is exchanging the low speed, high torque input for high speed, low torque output suitable for electrical power generation. Now keep in mind the term high and low are only relative in nature. 14.4 kilonewton meters of torque is more than enough torque to rip your balls right out of your sockets if you or a piece of your personal protective gear or clothing gets tangled up in the high speed shaft. It's for this reason shrouds are commonly used to cover rotational mechanical hazards. Additionally, consider where that missing 0.1 megawatt or 100 kilowatts of losses went. Did it just disappear? No. This power is going towards non-useful, destructive output, namely frictional losses, vibration, heat, and sound. This is why it's essential that a gearbox include not just the gears, bearings, shafts, seals, and housing, but also means of lubricating and cooling these components. This 100 kilowatts of losses has to go somewhere, and the film of oil coating the moving gears not only eliminates destructive metal-to-metal -metal contact, but also transfers the heat away from the mating surfaces. It's for this reason you'll sometimes see a radiator or a heat exchanger used to cool the gearbox oil and rid itself of this heat so the oil doesn't thermally degrade and the gearbox continues to function properly. This also explains why gearboxes are built out of heavy, heavy metal rather than compressed cheese. The housing must be robust enough to absorb and dissipate the losses inherent in its operation. Lastly, consider the efficiency of this complete system. One might be shocked to realize of the available 5 megawatts of wind power, the turbine delivers only 1.7 megawatts of usable real electric power output to the grid. This is an efficiency rating of only 34%. This efficiency figure is something the gullible jerks of the world are quick to seize upon. My follow-up observation to this is, who cares? Wind turbines use free fuel. Yes, renewable energy systems are initially more expensive to install. And yes, they need to be maintained just like you would a gas generator or a coal-fired power plant 
And yes, balancing intermittent distributed sources like solar and wind is more complicated than traditional centralized generation. But when the wind blows, the river runs or the sun shines, as they are regularly known to do, renewable fuel quite literally falls from the sky. All you got to do is catch it. Who cares if you spill an armload if your planet is regularly bathed in it? But I digress. Let's check out another example of mechanical power, torque, and rotational speed. Consider a three-phase AC induction motor with the following data specified in the motor nameplate. We know this is a 15-horsepower motor with a rated speed of 1765 RPM. It's designed to operate using either 230 volts or 460 volt three-phase AC systems. In the low voltage configuration, each line draws a whopping 39 amps when operated at the rated condition and 19.5 amps in the high voltage configuration. At the rated condition, it looks like it has a power factor of 0.79 and it's known to be 91% efficient. We'll examine motor nameplates and other entries on the motor nameplates in later lectures. We're being asked to determine torque in units of newton meters and real electrical power input in units of watts consumed by this motor while in operation. Let's assume we're in the high voltage, 460 volt configuration. First, the easy part. Let's use the power and speed data to determine the rated torque. A unit conversion demonstrates 15 horsepower is roughly equivalent to 11.2 kilowatts of power. An algebraic manipulation of the mechanical power formula solving for unknown torque demonstrates torque equals mechanical power times 9.55 divided by rotational speed. Substituting in the given mechanical power and rotational speed values demonstrates this motor exerts roughly 60.5 newton meters of torque at the rated condition. Now the somewhat more difficult part. There are a couple ways to determine real electrical power input. Method one, use mechanical power output and efficiency to determine real electrical power input. Method two, use apparent power and power factor to determine real electrical power input. Importantly, both methods should yield reasonably close answers. Method one, Motors consume real electrical power and produce mechanical power. The degree of effectiveness of this conversion is the measurable quantity efficiency. Efficiency is equal to usable mechanical power output over real electrical power input. An algebraic manipulation of the efficiency formula solving for real electrical power input demonstrates real electrical power input is equal to output divided by efficiency. Substituting our given values demonstrates real electrical power input must equal roughly 12.3 kilowatts. Method two, motors consume apparent power of which there are real and reactive dimensions. Apparent power in a three phase AC system is equal to square root three times line to line voltage times line current. Substituting our given values demonstrates apparent power equals roughly 15.5 kilovolt amperes. Power factor is equal to real power over apparent power. An algebraic manipulation of the power factor formula solving for real electrical power input demonstrates real electrical power input is equal to apparent power times power factor. An algebraic manipulation of the power factor formula solving for real electrical power input demonstrates real electrical power input is equal to apparent power times power factor. Substituting our given values demonstrates real electrical power input equals roughly 12.3 kilowatts. You will note that the real power figures obtained using the two different methods agree within a reasonable degree of accuracy. That's the point. There's one right answer and both methods yield this right answer. All right, now that we've got a basic understanding of rotating mechanical power, torque, and rotational speed, let's talk about direction. As you are no doubt aware, motors and generators are different aspects of what may more appropriately be called a rotating electrical machine. Motors convert electrical power input into rotational mechanical power output. Generators convert rotational mechanical power input to electrical power output. It's really that simple. The simplicity quickly unravels when we start introducing numbers. In order to establish some clarity, allow me to make the first of several proclamations. Proclamation one, clockwise is positive. Counterclockwise is negative. This applies to both torque and rotational speed. Consider a motor revolving at 1750 RPM clockwise and exerting 1.4 newton meters of torque also in the clockwise direction. With both quantities in the clockwise direction, we would assign positive polarities to both torque and rotational speed. An application of the mechanical power formula 
demonstrates positive 1.4 times positive 1750 divided by 9.55 yields positive 256.5 watts of mechanical power. Now consider this same motor performing the same task only in the counterclockwise direction, i.e. 1750 RPM counterclockwise and 1.4 newton meters of torque counterclockwise. With both quantities in the counterclockwise direction, we would assign negative polarities to both rotational speed and torque. An application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates negative 1.4 times negative 1750 divided by 9.55 similarly yields positive 256.5 watts of mechanical power. What is the significance of proclamation 1? As these two example problems are meant to illustrate, it means a motor always produces positive mechanical power because torque and rotational speed are always exerted in the same direction. Positive times positive equals positive, as does negative times negative. Motors always produce positive mechanical power. Proclamation 2. Power in equals power out. This is not a new proclamation, but rather a fundamental law of the universe you've probably had ample exposure to by now. This does not mean all input power is converted to usable power, but rather all input power goes somewhere, usable or losses. For the sake of simplicity, let's consider this motor to be 100% efficient. On a very basic level, we know that motors convert electrical power to mechanical power. If this motor was 100% efficient, and it is known to produce positive 256.5 watts of usable mechanical power output, and power in equals power out, this must mean it is consuming positive 256.5 watts of real electrical power. When displayed in this fashion, electrical on the left, mechanical on the right, what is the significance of proclamation 2? It means motors always consume positive electrical power. Tracking so far? Clockwise is positive, counterclockwise is negative, motors always produce positive mechanical power and always consume positive electrical power. Let's now discuss the other nature of rotating electrical machines, generators. Generators are driven by prime movers like expanding steam, falling water, rotor engines, or moving wind. Most people can conceptually accept the fact that motors consume electrical power for torque and speed to come out. What a significant percentage of people don't understand is that a prime mover must overcome oppositional torque to spin a generator at a certain speed and electrical power just doesn't appear from nowhere. Generators consume mechanical power and produce electrical power. Let's deal with these observations one at a time. Prime movers must overcome oppositional torque when driving a generator. If you've ever tried to pull two magnets apart, you'll recall they exhibit a measurable stickiness in opposition to your efforts. Consider a prime mover driving a generator clockwise at 1860 RPM. According to our earlier definitions, clockwise rotation would be considered positive. In doing so, let's say the generator experiences an oppositional torque backwards, let's say of 7.7 .7 kilonewton meters, as it works to force the rotor past the magnetic poles of the stator. In this case, the counter torque opposes the prime mover in the counterclockwise direction. Get it? Counterclockwise oppositional torque opposes the prime mover's clockwise efforts. According to our earlier definitions, counterclockwise torque would be considered a negative polarity. Positive rotational speed, negative torque. An application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates the generator is producing negative mechanical power. In this case, the generator is producing close to negative 1.5 megawatts of mechanical power. Let's again presume this system is 100% efficient. If power in equals power out, this means the generator must likewise be consuming close to negative 1.5 megawatts of real electrical power. What does this nonsense mean? Listen to the emphasis I'm placing on specific terms. The generator consumes negative 1.5 megawatts of real electrical power and produces negative 1.5 megawatts of mechanical power. Wouldn't it be better to state the obvious? The generator consumes 1.5 megawatts of mechanical power input and produces positive 1.5 megawatts of real power output. 
These statements are equivalent. And yes, the second phrasing is more semantically correct, but stick with me for a moment and explore the utility of the first statement. The generator consumes negative 1.5 megawatts of real electrical power and produces negative 1.5 megawatts of mechanical power. Polarity and consistency matter. If we stick with our earlier definitions, i.e. positive clockwise, negative counterclockwise, and power in always equals power out, we can make some pretty reliable predictions about motors and generators, both of which should be readily obvious. A motor always produces torque in the same direction as rotational speed. Positive clockwise torque times positive clockwise speeds yield positive mechanical power output. Similarly, negative counterclockwise torque times negative counterclockwise speed always yields positive mechanical power output. Motors always produce positive mechanical power. If we assume 100% efficiency and power in equals power out, motors always consume positive electrical power. Conversely, a generator always experiences counter torque in the opposite direction as rotational speed. Positive clockwise speed times negative counterclockwise torque yields negative mechanical power output. Negative counterclockwise speed times positive clockwise torque yields negative mechanical power output. Generators always produce negative mechanical power output. If we assume 100% efficiency and power in equals power out, generators always consume negative electrical power. Yes, this is admittedly the same thing as consuming positive mechanical power and producing positive electrical power, but if we use this polarity convention, rather than flip-flopping the sides of the equality, it's readily identifiable which role an electrical machine is fulfilling, motor or generator. If mechanical power is the product of torque and rotational speed, both of which have polarity, we can divide an electrical machine into four quadrants of operation. Motors producing clockwise torque in the clockwise direction, motors producing counterclockwise torque in the counterclockwise direction, generators producing counterclockwise torque in the clockwise direction, and finally, generators producing clockwise torque in the counterclockwise direction. For example, consider an electrical machine producing 5 newton meters of clockwise torque rotating 1140 RPM in the clockwise direction. Both properties are positive. Positive times positive equals positive. An application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates that this is a motor producing positive 596.9 watts of mechanical power. Consider another electrical machine producing negative 3 newton meters of counterclockwise torque rotating at negative 1730 RPM in the counterclockwise direction. Both properties are negative. Negative times negative equals positive. An application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates that this is also a motor, only this time it's producing positive 543.5 watts of mechanical power. Next, consider an electrical machine producing negative 2.5 newton meters of counterclockwise torque, although it's rotating at 1600 RPM in the clockwise direction. Torque is negative, speed is positive. Negative times positive equals negative. An application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates that this is a generator producing negative 418.8 watts of mechanical power. What does the production of negative mechanical power mean? It means that the generator is consuming 418.8 watts of mechanical power. And importantly, the prime mover, i.e. the wind, water, rotating engine, or expanding steam driving that generator, needs to be able to produce at least 418.8 watts of mechanical power to move it. Electrical power doesn't come from nowhere. Lastly, consider an electrical machine producing 4.5 newton meters of clockwise torque rotating at negative 1260 RPM in the counterclockwise direction. Torque is positive, speed is negative. Positive times negative equals negative. An application of the mechanical power formula demonstrates that this is a generator producing negative 593.7 watts of mechanical power, which we all know means the generator is consuming 593.7 watts of mechanical power. I'll readily admit polarity is a housekeeping trick. However, you can't argue with the results. I found this technique really emphasizes the different aspects of rotating electrical machines, motors on one side and generators on the other. Positive times positive equals positive, negative times negative equals positive. These are motors. Conversely, positive times negative equals negative, and negative times positive equals negative. These are generators. 
Case in point, let's take another look at the speed torque curve for a Design B three-phase AC squirrel cage induction motor. You recall the speed torque curve for a Design B three-phase AC squirrel cage induction motor we examined earlier looks something like this, where torque is plotted on the vertical y-axis and rotational speed on the horizontal x-axis. Taking into account polarity, you realize this only presents the motor's operation in the clockwise or positive direction. If we wanted to be more thorough about this, we could extend this into the counterclockwise or negative direction. In doing so, a more complete chart might look something like this. In counterclockwise operation, the motor rotates counterclockwise and produces counterclockwise torque. This still results in the production of positive mechanical power, because negative times negative yields a positive value, as does positive times positive. This means these two sections of the speed torque curve represent motor mode. There shouldn't be too much of a stretch if you've been following the previous conversation. Here's where people kind of lose their minds. You note this chart as presently illustrated is for speeds below the synchronous speed, i.e. the speed of the rotating magnetic field produced by the stator. What happens if some outside force, like moving wind, falling water, a rotating engine, or expanding steam, i.e. a prime mover, grabbed the shaft of the rotor and started spinning at faster than synchronous speed? We might get a more comprehensive speed torque curve that looks something like this. You know, the more comprehensive speed torque curves now feature two almost mirror images of the motor modes reflected through the horizontal axis. What does the extension on the right imply? Clockwise or positive speed and counterclockwise or negative torque. Similarly, what does the extension on the left imply? Counterclockwise or negative speed and clockwise or positive torque. Both of these regions of operation imply generator operation. Positive times negative equals the production of negative mechanical power, as does negative times positive. You'll again recall the production of negative mechanical power is just a stupid and confusing way of saying consumption of positive mechanical power. This more holistic chart reveals something interesting about induction motors where the term motor is in quotation marks. They're not motors. They are rotating electrical machines and can be used as motors or generators. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. If this is too, too much for your tiny eggshell mind right now, relax and fear not. We will revisit this concept in much later lectures on asynchronous generators. The important facts for this lecture remain clear. Mechanical power is torque times rotational speed divided by a constant. Clockwise is positive, counterclockwise is negative. Motors consume positive real electrical power and produce positive mechanical power. Generators consume negative real electrical power and produce negative mechanical power, which again, we all know is a confusing and stupid way of saying a generator consumes mechanical power and produces real electrical power. You'd think that'd be all there is to say about mechanical power, torque, and rotational speed, but let's drag this out a little bit longer and quickly discuss the tools one might use to measure these properties, dynamometers and tachometers. Since no one on earth can spell these words, let alone pronounce them, most people refer to them as dynos or tacks. Even if you don't walk away from this lecture fully understanding torque, speed, and mechanical power, you'll walk away sounding like you do if you use these cool slang terms. Dynos measure torque and tachometers measure rotational speed. There are two, technically three different types of dynos. The first one being an absorption dyno, which if you think about it, is kind of like a punching bag for a motor. You can load a motor up by increasing oppositional torque and measure the torque exerted by the motor to balance this oppositional torque and display it on a meter. Old school examples of this type might be a frictional wheel or a prony brake. A drive dyno is the exact opposite. It produces torque to drive an electrical machine and it'll display the oppositional torque that the electrical machine is exerting against it. The third type is a universal dyno, which is a combined absorption and drive dyno. Such a device is useful in a lab setting to discuss the dual aspects of motors and generators. There are several methods of measuring speed, but they all fall into two general categories, contact and non-contact tachometers. Contact tachometers are sometimes called tachometer generators, and they obviously physically need to contact the device they're supposed to measure. They produce an analog output voltage proportional to RPM. Slower speed results in lower output voltage, faster speed results in higher output voltage. The output can be read on a needle meter or input to a computer and digitized for later processing. Non-contact methods of rotational speed measurements are numerous. A handheld retroreflective laser tachometer can be used to measure the speed of a rotating mechanical object under inspection. 
This necessitates a piece of glint tape being installed on the motor shaft to return the transmitted laser light back to the receiver. The laser tack can't be held too close nor too far away if you want accurate results. Resist the temptation of shining this tool in your or your lab partner's eyes. You don't need to pay some unschooled youth $8 an hour to sit there with a laser tachometer to get valid rotational speed readings because there are numerous automated methods of doing so, all falling under the blanket term rotary encoders. If all we're concerned about is rotational speed and not direction or position, a single Hall effect or inductive sensor on a shaft is more than sufficient to do so. Every time an indicator, the presence or absence of a metal object passes through the sensor, it detects the presence or absence and indicates it with a pulse, hence the term pulser. If a single indicator on a shaft passes a sensor 30 times in one second, this means the shaft is traveling 1800 RPM. The single sensor scheme has a disadvantage though, because we can't tell which direction those pulses are coming from. A single clockwise rotation produces the same number of pulses as a single counterclockwise rotation. This disadvantage can be overcome with two sensors with a slight angular offset between them. Tag A is in front of tag B, and when the shaft is rotated clockwise, sensor A receives a signal before sensor B in the same line. Opposite if rotated counterclockwise, sensor B would receive the signal before sensor A. As with a single tag pulser, the time it takes between subsequent signals at each sensor is indicative of speed. There are varying levels of complexity of this type of rotational speed measurement and is sometimes referred to as quite surprisingly as AB encoding, incremental encoding, and or quadrature encoding. We'll get to these methods much later. Much, much later, we might visit absolute encoding, in which each angular position in the shaft is assigned a specific binary address utilizing something called gray code, where only one bit position changes for each transition to the next position. For now, just think of these advanced methods as super fancy methods of determining not only rotational speed and direction, but also relative or exact position of a shaft. All right, that's about it for today. In conclusion, this lecture can introduce the concept of torque and examine how torque and rotational speed influence mechanical power. Additionally, we introduce the concept of polarity and how this polarity shell game keeps you track of whether a machine is consuming electrical power and outputting mechanical power in motor mode or consuming mechanical power and outputting electrical power in generator mode. Finally, we discuss common instrumentation used to measure torque and rotational speed. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.